Hello, everybody. I know it has been um, <clears throat> quite a decent bit of time since I made a video. I am now back, and oh boy, here we go again. Worst Tank Concepts of World War II, Volume 2, Electric Boogaloo. Well, incredibly, here we go again. Mr. Table Size is mocking yet another American tank. This one is called the T-18 Howitzer Motor Carriage. Development started on it in September 1941 as a close support vehicle based on the M3 Stuart, intended to be a successor to the rather unsuccessful T3 Howitzer Motor Carriage, which we will definitely cover in another video. <laughs> Hilariously enough, the vehicle was actually designed by Firestone and featured a redesigned superstructure with a limited traverse mount fitted with a 75mm M1A1 pack howitzer with two 30 caliber machine guns mounted in the sponsor to the side. Eventually, a prototype was delivered to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds where it was discovered that the vehicle actually had fantastic mobility considering all the alterations and was discovered to be only marginally slower than the standard M3 Stewart. But ultimately, that's where all the good points end. The vehicle featured two inches of frontal armor which was... Okay. But the problem was is that it was totally vertical. Speaking of that frontal armor, it was so front-heavy that the vehicle noticeably began to sag at the end of the testing. Other issues were found, such as the gun having a very poor range of traverse, the driver only having a single forward-facing periscope, no vision ports for the commander or the crew to check the flanks when the hatches were closed, no ventilation fans for the main gun, which would ultimately result in a huge amount of fumes building up inside the vehicle. And the biggest problem of all for this project was the fact the project was cancelled before the prototype had even been delivered. So it really makes you wonder why bother testing a tank that's already been rejected. Anyway, only a single armor steel prototype was ever completed, and ultimately was apparently around the Aberdeen Proving Grounds until 1947, when it mysteriously disappeared off the face of the map. It's not some kind of conspiracy, it probably was just melted down. The Panther with the 30mm MK-108. This was a proposal submitted sometime in 1944, we really don't know when. And the idea was, was to take the Panther tank and fit a 30mm cannon to it in order to deal with low-flying, strafing aircraft. The idea in and of itself doesn't sound that horrible until you look at how the Germans were planning to execute that idea. First design was, from what I can gather, judging by the way Spielberger words it, it sounds like the first design was going to be the 30mm MK-108 cannon would have been mounted in the mantlet, which then it would have had to rely on the main gun's traverse, which would have severely limited its movement. The other one is just all kinds of insane, which was that it would be mounted on the back of the turret in its own little mount where it would have a free range of traverse, whatever that means. I can already tell you one of the big issues this design would have had was the cannon that it was planning to use, which is the 30mm MK-108. That cannon was being used in numerous aircraft by the Luftwaffe, and I don't think the Luftwaffe would have been so keen to hand over their cannons to the army, especially considering that they were lucky enough to get their cannons whenever the factories weren't being bombed. The other major problem I can see with this design is how much of a specialized role it has to take which is it's designed to engage only low-flying aircraft, which very much limits its capabilities in the field. For the first time on Table Size Productions, we are mocking a British tank. Or shall I say British? I deeply apologize to my British viewers, that was a horrible, horrible attempt at sounding British. Anyway, the Valiant. So design work on this thing started at some point in August 1942, and the project was originally under the supervision of Vickers Armstrong, but apparently Vickers Armstrong wasn't able to complete the project, so it was ultimately handed off to Rolls-Royce who couldn't complete the project, so then it was handed to Rustin and Hornsby. 
It was apparently proposed as an improved successor to the Valentine, but we will quickly get to why that is not the case. It was supposed to be fitted with a 75mm gun, but that never materialized, so it ultimately just got stuck with a 6-pounder gun. Already, there were numerous problems. The major one being that the prototype wasn't completed until 1944, and by the time the prototype was completed, the project was already totally out of date. Either way, it was decided to go ahead with trials in May 1945, as the suspension was seen to be something worthy of further research. Anyway, before trials had even begun, there were already problems that were found. One being that the ground clearance was abysmally low, having only 9.6 inches of rear ground clearance and 8.9 inches of rear suspension clearance. The ground clearance was so low, in fact, that it was believed there was a possibility of the suspension bolts being sheared off during cross-country travel. Speaking of cross-country travel, the cross-country testing never took place as the vehicle never reached the testing ground. In a 13-mile drive to the testing ground, an enormous amount of problems were found. One being that the engine oil had been overfilled prior to driving, and resulted in oil spitting out of the oil breather, which was found to be the result of a lack of an oil dipstick. Another issue that made itself more apparent as time went on was that the steering tillers had been improperly adjusted, which resulted in the driver having to stop due to excessive fatigue. But I'm not done yet! The foot brake on this thing had to be operated with the heel, which could result in the driver's heel getting trapped between the foot brake and the floor plate, and could, quote, cause serious injury. Shifting into fifth gear was found to be nearly impossible as the gear lever was far too close to the right steering lever and battery boxes, which could result in the driver snapping his wrist. Shifting into first gear was found to be incredibly difficult due to being positioned behind the battery boxes, and disengaging from first gear was impossible without the aid of a crowbar. The driver's positioning was also found to be at fault, as during cross-country travel, there was a possibility for the driver's head to collide with the hatch doors directly above him. Another issue was found, which was that the GMC engine it was equipped with was incredibly underpowered, which resulted in the vehicle struggling on the slightest of inclines. There's more. The suspension lubrication points were found to be incredibly fragile and would very likely fail under cross-country travel. No level plug was included for the right-hand final drive, making any kind of proper servicing completely impossible. Gearbox fluid levels and steering brake adjustment could only be done with the removal of the incredibly heavy rear access louvers, and required three of the crew to lift it. The vehicle was ultimately towed back to the workshop after this horrible failure, which ultimately resulted in the vehicle being deemed unsafe to drive. The project was eventually scrapped, and amazingly enough, the prototype was kept. In fact, the vehicle is currently on display at the Bovington Tank Museum. Uh, well, we did it. We have officially completed Volume 2 of the worst tank concepts of World War II. Uh, you know, honestly, these things, some of them you can see where there was some promise. Other ones, it just completely baffles me as to why they ever were considered for any kind of development. Anyway, I'm gonna just go try and forget some of the things that I have read. Uh, bye, I guess? I don't know.